Hi, today we're going to go through patient assessment. This is the first skill that any nurse learns when they start in ITU. So we're going to break it up into sections. We're going to start off with respiratory, then cardiovascular, then abdominal and central nervous system. So to start with a respiratory assessment um, for a ventilated patient, the first thing you want to check is that your patient doesn't look distressed. Um, we're first going to have a look at the airway. So the patient has an ET tube in place um, and is ventilated. You want to have a look and check the size of that ET tube um, and just check the location on the lip level. Now you want to compare the lip level to when the patient was intubated to make sure that the tube hasn't migrated. You then want to make sure the tapes aren't, tapes aren't too tight and we will then check the cuff pressure. We've got a mammometer here and when you place the cuff on you want to make sure that it's in the green section. You don't want the cuff too low so secretions can track down into the lungs. So now that we're happy that the airway's in place, we just want to check down for any signs of tracheal deviation, which there isn't. And then we just want to have a feel to see if you can feel any surgical emphysema, um, which could indicate air within the tissues, and I can't feel anything there. Next, we want to have a look at the patient's breathing pattern um, and just have a look what mode of ventilation that they're on. So at the minute, this patient is on full control ventilation. Um, we want to have assess the rate, rhythm and depth of breathing and make sure that they're not using any respiratory muscles. So I can see that her respiratory rate is good. I'm just going to check that her lungs are expanding equally which they are, so I'm happy with that. Next, I'm going to um, auscultate the chest, have a listen for breath sounds. Now, ideally, what I would do is remove the patient's gown and actually assess the patient's chest, but obviously for the patient's um, dignity, I won't do for this assessment. Um, what I will do is when I remove the gown is just have a look for any scarring, any abnormalities in the chest that may actually affect her ventilation. So when it comes to auscultating the chest, we start at the apexes of the lungs and you listen bilaterally. And then we work down, so you do the upper, the middle, and then you want to listen to the bases of the lungs, which are right at the back under the rib cage. Now, when we listen for breath sounds, what we normally expect to hear um, are the upper airways are more bronchial breath sounds. So they're much louder because they're much larger airways. As you move further down the lungs, to the um, lower part of the lung tissue, it's more of a fascicular sound, a much more soft, wind-like sound. So once we're happy with the patient's um, rate, rhythm and depth of respiration, what, to, what we want to check now is that they're well perfused um, and not cyanosed. So what we'll do is just have a look at their peripheral perfusion, so have a look at their um, fingers and toes, make sure they're um, nice, pink and warm, and check their capillary refill, which we will go on to during the cardiovascular assessment. Um, we'll then check for central cyanosis, so we'll have a look at the lips and the tongue, make sure that there's um, no sign of hypo um, hypoxia or bluish tint to them. You can also check um, central cyanosis by pressing for five seconds on the sternum and then releasing and you want the colour to return quite quickly within two seconds. Um, so that's just a basic overview of a respiratory assessment for a ventilated patient. So the next part of patient assessment we're going to look at is the cardiovascular assessment. Um, as before with respiratory, what we need to know is the uh, patient's past medical history, um, so if they've got any relevant cardiovascular, his um, cardiovascular history, such as high blood pressure, previous MIs, cabbage, anything along those lines. So to start off with, our patients will be monitored. Uh, they'll normally usually have ECG monitoring and arterial pressure monitoring, along with CVP monitoring. 
So you just want to check that they've got an adequate blood pressure for them and their, um, their heart rates and what rhythm they're in. Um, next thing we want to check for peripheral cyanosis um, or perfusion, we have a look at their peripheries and we can see that she's warm, pink and well perfused. So to do a capillary refill, you press and hold on the fingernail for five seconds and the blood should return quickly within two seconds. And she feels warm to touch. Now, the other thing we'd look for is any sign of edema um, and there's no sign of peripheral edema on the arms. So to move on to the legs, bring all these back. Again, you want to feel the temperature of the skin, that's very important. Um, if the patient feels cold, you want to feel up the legs to see where they get warm, as that can be a sign of how well filled the patient is. So the patient is warm to touch, um, there's no sign of edema or pitting edema again, so we know she's not overloaded. And we'll do another capillary refill and the blood returns within two seconds. Next we want to check her pulses. So we want to feel for a pedal pulse to see if we can palpate this and also check for a dorsal pedus which are both present. So that's a sign that the patient is well filled, uh, warm and well perfused. Again we just want to have a check for a radial pulse and just compare that to what the patient's heart rate would be on the monitor. Now alongside um, the cardiovascular assessment we want to have a look at the patient's line assessments. So ideally you'd have a look at their arterial line, central line, any IV cannulas that they might have in place. It's very important to have a look at the insertion site to make sure that you can see the entry point of the line and there's no sign of redness or swelling or infection. Um, you also want to check how long your line has been in date. Um, if the patient is showing new signs of infection, such as a raised temperature, raised inflammatory markers, you want to consider the lines as a possible source of infection and actually look at changing those lines. Um, just to complete the patient assessment for cardiovascular, um, you'd want to check the patient's temperature. Um, make sure they're not hyper or hypothermic. Again, these can both be signs of infection. Um, and have a look at the patient's labs results. Um, so you want to see what their clotting shows, their platelet counts, their HB, their white, white blood cell counts, because all of this can um, be a sign of coagulopathies. Also, you want to have a look for any excessive bleeding on your patient. So have a look at the bleeding around the gums or mucous membranes, excessive bleeding around the IV sites, also look for signs of any um, hemorrhaging under the skin because that can be a sign of um, coagulopathies. So the next part of the assessment is abdominal assessment. This will actually include looking at the patient's nutritional status, their renal status and their abdomen. So when we assess the patient's nutritional assessment, uh, most of our patients normally have nasogastric feeding. So you want to make sure that they've got um, the correct regime for them and they've been seen by a dietitian. Um, that they're actually absorbing their feed, so we aspirate every four hours to check this and check the pH of the stomach. We also keep a very close eye on their blood sugar levels. Um, every two hours we would do BM readings. Uh, we would start insulin when their um, BM goes above 10 and aim to keep the blood sugar at 8. Now our patient doesn't have an NG tube um, for this assessment, so we'll, we won't look into that. The next part of an abdominal assessment would look at the renal function. So again, you want to have a look at your urea and creatinine on your blood results. Um, look at the patient's acid-base balance on their gases to see if they've got a metabolic acidosis. You want to check their urine output every hour to make sure it's 0.5 mils per kilogram. Um, so the next part will have a look at the patient's abdomen. Um, and this will include auscultation, palpation and inspection. Um, so what we want to have a look at, ideally um, with your patient you'd expose them so you can actually see their abdomen, see if there's any scarring there, if they've had any previous surgeries that you need to know about. Um, you want to see if the abdomen is distended and tense. So what we'll do is a bit of light palpation, so we're just feeling for anything unusual, any masses, 
Now, under the right-hand rib, ribs, you can normally palpate a liver if that is enlarged. I can't feel anything there. We also check when doing palpation to see if the patient's in any distress, if they're showing any signs of pain, discomfort or guarding. Next, what we want to do is um, percuss the abdomen. So if you take your middle index finger and tap, What we're listening for is any tympanic sounding um, sounds from the abdomen or anything dull which can indicate fluid within the abdomen. And part of inspection is you want to look for any abnormalities in bruising around the abdomen, what we'd call um, culling sign or grey turners, where you actually get bruising around the umbilicus or around the flank areas. Now this could indicate internal bleeding or acute pancreatitis, trauma to the abdomen. Um, if your patient's abdomen is large and distended and feels tense, um, you might consider wanting to do an um, abdominal pressure and we can do that via the Foley urine catheter. The next thing we do for abdominal is auscultation. So you want to have a listen for bowel sounds. Now to do this correctly, I think you should listen for about 10 minutes. Um, but for this, we won't. We'll just have a listen to what kind of bowel sounds we can hear. So what I'm listening out for, whether bowel sounds are absent, um, overactive or tinkling, which can be a sign of obstruction. And actually, this patient has normal bowel sounds present. So that reaches the end of our abdominal assessment. So lastly, we're going to assess uh, the patient's central nervous system um, and look at their sedation and whether it's appropriate for them. So my patient is currently sedated, um, so I'm not going to do a GCS, a glycocoma score, um, under sedation because that would be unfair to them. But what I will do is check their pupil reaction. So what I do is just shine a light. So what we do is take the left and right pupil and check them and then check that they've got consensual reaction so that the pupils are reacting together. Obviously we want a nice brisk reaction. Um, if they're sluggish or unreactive, fixed or dilated, then we want to report that to the medical staff. So the sedation scoring system, um, each shift the patient should be prescribed by the medical team the right level of sedation for them. And we use the Richmond assessment sedation scoring sy system. So we want to make sure that the patient is not heavily sedated, but light enough to arouse easily. Lastly, as part of the central nervous system, we want to make sure that the patient's got adequate pain relief. Um, and this is under sedation as well. So that when we do, um, do our daily sedation holds on patients, we know that they're not going to be in discomfort. So that completes a brief overview of how to assess a level 3 patient in intensive care. Um, the most important thing to remember is that you know your patient well, you know their past medical history um, and that you apply this to your patient.